Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Seth Joyner Show. Not a whole lot going on in the NFL, not a whole lot of chatter happening as far as the draft, but here we are. Um, running a little late today, as you can see, I'm dressed for the gym. I was at the gym, so I was running a little behind the schedule today. Um, and you know how Facebook is, they got all these rules. So, you know, they made me postpone push the show back 10 minutes because of when I set it up. Anyhow, I'm here. Let's talk. Today really is just going to be a talk to him show. You know, I'm going to take your questions so you guys can fire away. I'll give you guys an opportunity, you know, to get on. I'm sure there's some of you guys that are out there that thought there wasn't a show today. You didn't see the promos, any of that kind of stuff. But we're here. So as you scroll through Facebook, if you scroll through um, YouTube, if you over on it, um, um, on Twitter, we're live over there. If you're over on LinkedIn, we're um, we're live over there. Um, but I need you guys to just fire me some questions because, like I said, there's not a whole lot going on um, in the world of football right now. You know, NBA Finals are cranking up. You know, our uh, if you're a Philadelphia Eagle, a Philadelphia Seventy uh, Sixers fan, um, you know. Joel and the Sixers looking good. You know, if you're a Suns fan, Chris Paul and Devin Booker looking unbeatable. Um, you know, the Heat looking unbeatable right now. Got a resurgence uh, with the Golden State Warriors doing work. And yeah, yeah, I know you guys, you just want to hear football talk. But, you know, I'm a sportsman, man. I like all sports. I watch everything. I will watch badminton if they put it on TV. You know it. Um Let's get a couple of things out of the way, and then we'll dive into y'all's questions. You know, um, another cornerback off the market, Stephon Gilmore, um, signs with the Indianapolis Colts, two years, $20 million. That's 10 per um, with a max uh, $23 million. You know, I was kind of hoping that he'd hang around on the, um, on the market a little longer and somehow the Eagles could figure out a way, you know, to get him. Um, a lot of chatter all last week about Tyron Matthew. Um, he's still out there. Um, and a lot of chit-chat going on around these quarterbacks. Um, you know, with most teams starting their OTAs this week, um, you got a couple of quarterbacks that's not even attended. You've got um, Baker Mayfield, which is understandable. He's waiting to be moved on. Um, also, you know, rehabbing. I believe this is his non-throwing shoulder. Um, you got the same thing with Jimmy G. So for the time being, he's not attending, um, you know, the 49ers OTAs um, as he rehabs, you know, and, you know, tries to get himself fully, uh, fully, fully ready. The most perplexing one for me um, is Kyler Murray. Um and, and listen, there's been some rumors. Um, there's been some rumors connecting some trade talks between the Eagles and the Arizona Cardinals on behalf of Kyler Murray. Um, you know, I call BS, and this is why I call BS. The only time that I can think of the Eagles stepping outside of, you know, their, their squeaky clean look, um, and protecting their reputation was when they took a chance on Michael Vick. Um, great PR came along with it. I think that, you know, there's a fraternity among coaches where, you know, Tony Dungy, you know, asked Andy Reid and the Eagles, you know, to take a, take a shot on Michael Vick. But the Eagles always want players you know, who are team players. They want guys who are all in 
team guys. And the problem I see with Kyler Murray is that he's not a fit in Philadelphia. The same way that Carson James once wasn't a fit in Philadelphia, he's not a fit in Philadelphia. Um, when you read the tea leaves and you hear the rumors and you see what's going on with him and you understand what he's asking, he's asking the Cardinals. He's not asking, he's actually demanding it. And the Cardinals, the Arizona Cardinals, are really in a position where they cannot acquiesce to the demands of Colin Murray. And I'll tell you why. Um, every player wants to be paid. And I don't have a problem with guys being paid, not in the least little bit. OK. But there's a rhyme and a reason to everything that 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 the that teams do. Now, he didn't have to make this thing public. The Cardinals extended Steve Kine for the last three years. He's been on a hot seat in Arizona with the Cardinals. He's the GM of the Cardinals. Um, still can't figure out how in the hell Kip, Cliff Kingsbury got a five-year extension. So you got the GM who was on the hot seat that got extended. You got the head coach who hadn't proven anything, and he got extended. All Kyler Murray had to do was shut his damn mouth and just wait because they're all tied together. The three of them are intrinsically tied together, okay? All he had to do was be quiet, and the money was coming. The conversation, they were probably having the conversation. But when you open your mouth – and you step out and you put an organization on Front Street the way you've done, first with the letter from your agent, and now you've made the comment, hey, uh, I might not play this year unless, you know, I get a long-term deal. Well, dude, first of all, you're in the third year of a four-year deal with a fifth-year option as a first-round draft pick. Realistically, the Cardinals don't have to do a damn thing, Kyler Murray. They don't have to sign you to an extension, okay? You had one good season last year. Started off 9-0, and and then you went in the tank from there. You were lucky to make You just squeaked into, into the postseason. And in your letter, you made it seem like that it was all about you because you were a were a, an Arizona Cardinal because you were the quarterback that you deserve to have a long-term extension, okay? That within itself tells you a lot about who and what Kyler Murray is and why there's so much rumor swirling around this guy that he's selfish, he's a spoiled brat. You know, the Cardinals acquiesced to him, the head coach, you know, is more of a friend to him than he is a coach. There's no, no authority figure as far as that relationship is concerned. And then the rest of the guys on the roster are looking at this and, 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 and they're watching how the head coach and how the organization is going to deal with this situation. And this is the reason why they cannot sign him to this deal is because he's demanding it. Because if he's demanding it and they acquiesce, What's going to happen with other guys on the roster, you know, who, who have years left on their contract? Now, I get it. A lot of you guys will say, hey, you know what? He's a quarterback. It's a different set of circumstances. I agree. But at the same time, I'm going to let my man Jeff jump in here. I'm going to put his question up because I know he's got something to say. I didn't even read it. Once I saw it, he says, Kyle Murray crying and acting like he's supposed to have his extension early. I knew something was wrong when Larry Fitzgerald didn't come back. He left in too weird of a fashion. Okay. All right. So, Jeff, I got in the, I was playing golf with um, with my good friend Roy Green a couple of weeks ago. And we got into this debate um, about the whole Kyler Murray, Larry Fitzgerald thing, you know. And I was, I was pissed. You know, as I watched Larry's last year, I mean, they treated him like a redhead stepchild. And I'm like, I get that you got DeAndre Hopkins over there, okay? And he's probably, he's arguably the best wide receiver in all of football. But you can't act like the guy who's the face of your franchise ain't on the field until you need him to make a play on third down situation to move the chains. And every other time you decide that you're not even going to look his way. You're giving DeAndre Hopkins 12, 15 targets a game and Larry Fitzgerald's only getting two or three? A future 
first ballot Hall of Famer who can still play, and you treated him like that? First Colin Murray, and then I, I admonish Cliff Kingsbury for not having the conversation with Collar and figuring out a way to get Larry involved. So you know what? There's some merit to what you just said in this comment right here, Jeff. There's a whole lot of merit because, you know, I don't believe that Larry didn't want to play anymore. I think that Larry felt like the situation wasn't going to get any better under the circumstances with, with Cliff Kingsbury as the head coach and with Colin Murray having the type of power that he has. He knew that the situation wasn't going to get better. Now, don't get me wrong. I ain't putting, I'm not putting any words in Larry's mouth. He's a friend of mine, and I haven't even asked him about this. Okay? So don't y'all go spreading no damn rumors. But I'm telling you right now, from the outside looking in, you know, I felt bad for Larry his last year. You know, and I can understand why he didn't want to come back. Now, let's get back to Kyle. Okay? The Cardinals don't have to extend him. This is what they can do. They can say, dude, you can sit at home all you want to, okay? We own your rights. And if you don't play this year, guess what? You go into year four next year. And if you don't want to play next year, you go into year four the year after that. Oh, and by the way, we're just going to exercise that fifth year option on your ass just to make you, okay? Just to piss you off even that much more, okay? I just don't understand these guys. The entitlement. The entitlement. The game don't owe you nothing. Go out and just play. And if you play and you do what you're supposed to do and you perform, the money will take care of itself. Colin Murray didn't look like a guy that's worth $35, $40 million to me at the end of last year. Now, does he have a whole lot of potential? Absolutely. You know, could he stand, you know, some better play calling, some better opportunities and, you know, once DeAndre Hopkins got hurt last year, that offense went in the tank, okay? Do they need to go out and give him some more weapons and give him some better protection and implement more of a running game for him? Absolutely. I think he can make all the plays. It's not a fluke what he did at the beginning of the year. The first nine games, they went 9-0. He was just on fire. They looked unbeatable, okay? But the second half of the season and then – you add that to the mix, not only the second half of the season, DeAndre Hopkins being gone, I mean, he looked like a rookie quarterback the last eight games of the season, okay? So it's going to be interesting. Um, Matt Hatter right here, he wants to jump in. I'm going to let him throw his little comment up here. He said he had two great receivers and Hurts, Okay. Fire back. What great receiver did he have? You know, Christian Christian Kirk, um, A.J. Green, the same A.J. Green that, you know, was looking the wrong way when the ball was thrown to him in the end zone. Um, these guys are, you know, A.J. Green is the number three now. I'm still amazed that Christian Kirk got what they got, what he got, rather, okay, as a guy who really hasn't had a, a great year, but, hey, Somebody thought that, hey, we'll go and get him, we'll bring him in, and we can make him into something. Gave that kid a lot of money, okay? And Zach Ertz is a situational thing. Zach Ertz is going to find holes in the, in, the, in the zone, and he's going to beat you that way. Zach Ertz ain't beating nobody man-to-man. -man. He ain't getting open man-to-man. -man. That ship is sailed. That's done and over with, okay? Kyler Murray just – seem rattled and just a hot mess, you know, at the end of last year. And, um, yeah, Christian Patterson just put up, he said, the Jags, the Jags are the one that signed Christian Kirk, um, you know, to all that money, man. And um, come on, Matt Hatter, man. What, what season was you watching last year? DeAndre Hopkins got hurt, like, week – 10 or 11, and then was out the whole seat, the rest of the season. Um, <laughs> I like the combo. Now we starting to, you know, ramp it up. Drake W says, Collar wouldn't last six games in Philadelphia. You're exactly right. We'd have another Ben Simmons and another Carson Wentz on our hands if, if, 
if Howie brought Kyler Murray to Philadelphia. And then to make matters worse, you know, you'd have to – see, this is why, you know, these rumors make me laugh. Um, the one thing that Howie is masterful at, Howie is masterful at not making the same mistake twice, okay? He realized that Chip Kelly was a mistake because what Chip Kelly did was came in and stole power from Howie. So what did Howie do when he got back in power? He hired Doug Peterson, who had never been a head coach before. He hired Nick Sirianni, who had never been a head coach before, okay? He watched the guy that he handpicked, Carson Wentz, disintegrate after four years of being an eagle. And he saw what happened. He heard what was going on in the locker room, and he could see. You think for one second that Howie Rosen is going to trade for Colin Murray? Realizing that that guy could come in and repeat exactly what happened with Carson Wentz again, all over again, split a split locker room where some guys are on his side and other guys aren't? Ain't no way in hell Colin Murray is going to wind up and fill it up. No way. No way. All right? Also, let's jump over to Deshaun Watson reports um, to his new team. Um, the Cleveland Browns reports for um, OTAs. I'm excited to see, you know, what he does with that. And um, it'll be interesting because um, people don't want to let, you know, these non-indictment things, you know, go. They want to continue to talk about, you know, the civil suit, you know. And then he has said that he is he will vehemently, you know, defend himself as far as those civil suits are concerned. But it'd be great to see this kid back on the football field again and um and watching him do what he does best. Um hope he succeeds. Um let's see what else we got. Um that's some Eagles buzz. Um a lot of people, a lot of media people are saying it's not out of the realm of possibility that the Eagles might um, take a wide receiver in the first round. And you consider they're picking, I think it's what, 15 and 18? Um, I don't know, man. I, I just I just got an issue with how many wide receivers the Eagles have had to draft, you know, over the last 15 years. Um, and how few of them have been guys that have been cornerstones. And, and, and I'm talking about first round, second round, third round guys. Those guys should, are supposed to be you know, the cornerstones, um, the cornerstones, if you will, of your organization for a while. Um, but it just seems like every year we're talking about getting another wide receiver, you know, in the first round of the draft. Um, and I get they got two. But question you have to ask yourself, is the wide receiver position more important than, you know, one of these two stud linebackers that, that are available? Is wide receiver more important than, um, um, you know, potentially an edge rusher? Because the way they're talking about um, Kevon, you know, Thibodeau, that he's falling, falling, falling. I can't wait for him to fall to the Eagles. I hope he falls to the Eagles. Um they got a lot of needs. I'm not so sure that you can't satisfy some of those needs, you know, with you know, a veteran wide receiver and hope that some of these young guys, you know, come along. You got, you know, what? You got Rager who's going to get another year. If they don't, you know, make a move for draft capital on, on draft day, you got Hightower, you got Quez, you know, you got, you know, not star power, but you know, you got solid, a solid guy like Greg Ward Jr., you know, who you know you can put in there and he'll get the job done. Devontae Smith is just gonna get better. I'm not saying that they don't need another wide receiver, um, but as deep as this draft is, um, and, and one of the guy, you know, one of the guys that I got my eyes on, I talked about him last week, this kid Christian Watson from North Dakota State. Um I like what I see in him. He's big. He's 6'5", um, 208, 210 pounds, um, ran a sub-4340, sub-44, I should say. I think he ran 436. 
Um, his numbers are just off the charts. Um, big body to block. Um, North Dakota State lined him up in the backfield as a running back. Um, th- there's there's a lot to be, you know, excited about um, as far as you know the options that are out there, and 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 maybe you don't have to, maybe you don't have to, um, maybe you don't have to draft him so early. Maybe you can wheel and deal to get in the back end of the draft and be able to grab him there, or maybe he falls to the second round. I don't know. Um, it, it's it's going to be. Interesting to watch. You know, my colleague, you know, you guys know that Diddy Ray Dittinger believes that Howie will make some moves um, and trade up. And if that's the case, it's going to be really interesting to see who it is that they trade up to go get. Um, You know, the Eagles do a good job of not really showing their hand. Um, Even though everybody knows, you know, what what they need, um, Tom Kim says Mel Kuyper. <laughs> Mel Kuyper has Christian Watson going 22. Um, hey, listen, man. You, Tom, you act like Mel Kuyper has never made a mistake. Him and him and um, Todd McShay, boy, my goodness. If you look, if we listen to everything that they say, you know, none of us would be right. Only time we'll be right is 12 noon and 12 midnight when the clock is broke. That's about it. Um, listen, he couldn't move up. When you look at his numbers, a lot of these, a lot of these um these teams, you know, they get enamored with the numbers. The problem I have with the numbers is that every kid coming out of college, they know how to game the system. Everybody's gaming the system now. And, and how are they doing that? So I live in Arizona. There's Fisher Sports here. And there's um, um, Exos, okay? So most of these kids, they drop out of college the minute the bowl season is over, and they're here in Arizona or they're in California or they're down in Florida, and they're working on their 40, their vertical, their broad jump, their four cone. They're working on all that stuff, okay? And you got gurus out there that really show and teach these guys how to improve their 40 time, how to improve their three three cone drill, how to improve all of these things, okay? So now when they show up at the combine, you know, they've improved those things, but that doesn't necessarily make them a better football player. That just means that they're more proficient at running a 40, and they, they've gotten a little stronger. You know, they can get a couple more reps out of, you know, 225 or 185, you know, for the little guys, you know? So they're gaming the system. That doesn't necessarily mean a thing. But, you know, when guys run 40s like this and their metrics look like this, you know, the powers that be, they believe that, hey, you know what? These guys are moving up the board. They're shooting up the board. This guy's moving down, you know? And because we have no ends into, you know, what teams are thinking, you know, they hold us hostage from the combine to the draft until teams come out and actually make their picks. And then they sit up on ESPN on draft night and poo-poo some of the drafts that some of the picks that people make. Oh, he drafted, they drafted him too early. You know, um, that was a reach. Hey, listen, they've been, they've been scouting and looking at these guys for the last three years while these guys have been in college. They know what they want. They know what they're after. And, and, and sometimes the, the, the draft, you know, it's a crapshoot anyway. I would surmise to you that if you went and you – classic case in point, my man, right here, okay? Right, they worked out doing the Mike Mamula combine measurable game. It's exactly what they do. And Mike Mamula is my dude. I ain't got nothing against Mike. I Listen, I ain't got nothing against anybody who figure out a way to improve themselves, okay? Because when these teams – These GMs and these scouts, when they can't see the forest for the trees and they get blinded by the metrics and not the actual talent, that's on them when they make a mistake, you know? So I don't, I don't, I don't begrudge any of these players, you know, doing what they're doing. They're trying to get drafted as early as they can and, 
you know, make as much money as they can. And how how do you begrudge anybody of that? You know, but my point is, I got to go back and find my man's um, comments back here. Um, and give Tom some more love. He said, no, um, I don't go by Kuiper. He's close, though, but rarely right. Well, I mean, that that was my only point. I, 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 you know, I wasn't trying to, like, admonish you or anything. It's all good, man. I was just, um, I was just making the point, you know, these guys, all they, they, they spend the entire offseason, you know, uh, mock draft 1.0, 1 2.0, 3.0, 5.0. I mean, I'm so damn sick and tired of mock drafts, I don't know what to do. I'm so tired of the damn talking heads, I don't know what to do. You know what I do? I go on YouTube, and I get guys game film, and I watch how they play. And that's how I real, That's how I judge how good a player is, okay? Because you don't have guys like, like the safety from Notre Dame. Okay, the Hamilton kid. He goes to the damn combine and runs four, five, seven. And everybody all of a sudden, oh, he can't play. Well, not everybody runs good 40 times. Okay? A 40 is linear. It is 40 yards straight. I've seen players that run 4-3 that couldn't convert that 4-3 into playing speed. Because when you got to stop and, 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 and redirect and misdirect, can you apply that speed in those circumstances? You know, are you just a straight linear guy? You know, the straight linear guy I'm talking about is a guy like uh, Willie Gall. Like when, when Willie Gall played for the Chicago Bears, Willie ran a post, a corner, and a go route. Now he was fast, but he couldn't run all that other stuff underneath, nor did he want to run all of that stuff underneath. Okay. And if he caught somebody slipping, guess what? See you later. Strike up the band. Skip Carl says, hey, look at Cooper Cup ran 4-6-2. And can't nobody even cover him. Ain't that the damnest thing? I'm watching the Super Bowl. I'm like, OBJ is out, okay? Higby is out. The tight end's out. Woods has been out. The end of the game, they got one damn wide receiver on the field, and they couldn't stop him. He's just torching him. I blame the defense coordinator had no plan whatsoever, no adjustment, and the players for that matter. Because I can tell you right now, them damn crossing routes, if I was in there as a linebacker, oh, where's he at? You can bring, you can come across if you want to, you know. I mean, listen, he's an unreal talent. Mad Hatter, there you go. Give you some more love. Jerry Rice ran 4-6. Four, four, you wouldn't be able to tell it. Because I can tell you right now, I seen it up, up and close and personal. You know, when he put on the, when he turned on the Jets, it was a wrap, baby. I seen a whole lot of guys get lost in the, in the dust. Um, so my point being is that some of these guys, you know, are, they're moving up the draft board because they ran such good, you know, 40 times. And some of these guys, you know, didn't run good 40 times or whatever the metrics were. They didn't measure up, and now they they fallen off. But my thing is, look at what does the game film tell you? What does the game film tell you? When they're playing against a guy like, you know, see, my thing is, if Aiden Hutchinson is going to be the number one overall pick, when I look at game film, I want to see how Aiden Hutchinson plays against the best offensive lineman in the big the Big Ten. I want to see. Um, in the final four, I forget who they played against. I want to see how he played against the upper echelon guys, okay? Because it's one thing to beat the drums off of, you know, the the tackles at Purdue and the tackles at, you know, Illinois and the, tip, the tackles at, um, you know, the sisters of the sisters of the poor teams of the Pac-12, but how do you measure up against the best of the best? You know, and I'm not saying that he can't. I don't, you guys know me. I don't ever say what anybody can't do. Okay. Because there was a whole lot of people said what I couldn't do. Okay. And all I wanted was an opportunity to make all of them eat crow. So I don't ever say what a guy can't do until I see him on the field and I see him play. And I get enough tape that confirms what he can and what he cannot do, okay? 
I mean, listen, he may come in and be, you know, he, he may come in and, and, and be the truth. Who knows? That's the great thing about the draft is that we don't know who actually is going to come in and do the damn thing. The problem is there's a whole lot of speculation that goes on. There's a whole lot of pontification that goes on, you know, and two to three years later, what I like to do is take that tape and go back and listen to the gurus and ask them, you know, to validate their comments. Because when they talk about a guy that can't, and then all of a sudden in year three, that guy blossoms. And they talk about the guy that can, and in year two, that guy flames out, okay? Okay. There's no accountability. We never go back and we never talk about those types of things. Now, to me, that's must-see TV, okay? What did you see that make you that made you think that this guy was going to set the NFL on fire and in two years he was out the league? What did you see in this guy that made you to believe that he had no shot at making an NFL roster and in year three he's going to the Pro Bowl? See, that, that's why I never talk about, you know, what a guy can and what he can't do until I see him playing and doing what he's doing um, at the highest level. Um, so, listen, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, what teams around the league does. And um, it's going to be easy. It's going to be uh, interesting to see, um, you know, what, what our Philadelphia Eagles do. Um, that being said, I'm going to scroll back to the top and work my way down and, you know, take some of y'all's questions. I know there's a lot of more comments in here than there's necessarily questions. Um, but we're going to do it this way anyway. My man, Ron Hostler wants to know, am I good with drafting a wide receiver in the first round? Um, yes and no. Um, at 18, yes. At 15, no. Um, because I think the Eagles have already, you know, invested so much capital in the wide receiver position. It's like, how many times can you get it wrong um, before you figure it out? Um, I, I don't know. I hit, you know, and, and Victor. Victor Parker wants to know with the draft getting close, you know who the Eagles getting connected to at pick 15 and 16. I don't think anybody really knows, man. Nobody really knows. Um, you can look at what their needs are and you can kind of pontificate on what they should do or what they might do. But, you know, the way how we, you know, moves and wheels and deals, it's hard to get a gauge on, you know, who they're actually looking at um, because you don't have – you don't have the option. You don't have the, you know, you don't have the ability to look at their draft board and see how they got guys slotted. And as you watch players go off the board, you know, then this guy moves up and is, is it a guy that they, you know, are they drafting for need or are they drafting the best available? Uh, that's another big question that you have to ask. Most teams live in the world of, oh, you know, we're going to draft the best available. Um, but if you've got, a dearth of guys at that position, you know, maybe you don't need that guy, you know, but the way that the media is, you know, they have a way of, you know, making you look bad when you make a decision that doesn't work out um, or you take a guy and there was another guy, a la DK Metcalf, a la Justin Jefferson. Now you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Um, let's see. And my man Adams Esplor, let's just jump off the subject for a while. He said he worried about James Harden. Why are you worried about James Harden, man? You know, throw your comment back on. Why are you worried about James Harden? Man? The Sixers are two and zero. Oh. The last two games they've had like five guys scoring double figures, and James Harden had fourteen assists in game one. And yeah, his numbers were down a little bit last night, but. You know, they don't they don't need him to be the guy. You know, there's gonna come a time in the series where they're gonna need him to light it up. And he's gonna give you one of those, you know, 30 point games. But when you got the league MVP doing it and you get, you know, this dark horse 
is coming out throwing up 38. You know, Tyreek Maxey in the first game. Come on, man. James Harden, that's all, all he needs to do is be a facilitator and play a little bit of defense, which we know he don't like to do anyway. I digress. Let's um, let's continue here and see. Let me pull up some of your questions. Um, Tom, um, he said, do I think how he moves up for, sh- for a short thing? Listen, there's nothing. Tom, there's nothing that's a short thing. You just never know it, Howard. You, you know, who saw the deal with the Saints? Who saw that happen? You know, three, three, four weeks before the draft. So anything is possible with this dude because he ain't sitting pat on nothing. He is just – he got his bandana on, and he is robbing teams with no gun. And he's been doing it for a while. I mean, he's very good at – you know, making moves and acquiring draft capital and clearing cap space. Very good at it. Um, let me see. Um, all right. Eric, Eric Kyler uh, says he's a huge fan. I'm curious who's the most physical player you played against. Um, and who talked the most trash? Thanks. Um, Gosh. The most physical player, I won't pick one player. Most physical offense was the Washington, um, well, the Afro, the Washington football football team, you know, used to be the Redskins. Their offensive line. Man, let me tell you something. On Monday, you knew that you'd been in a war. They run those kind of trades and pulling those guards, and you know, <laughs> it is, it was. It was just the most physical game that you played. We had to play them twice a year, every year. Um, who talked the most trash? Um, that's interesting. I think nobody talked more trash than Charles Haley. Um, and Charles Haley would talk trash to his mama if he could. I mean, dude just would never shut up. Never shut up. I mean, on the football field, off the football. Like, when I see Charles now, he's still bumping his gun. And he, neither one of us played football in over 20 years. Um, let's see. Um, this is interesting. This is, a, this is a good question. Linda wants, Linda, you know, Linda wants to know how confident are you and Howie with the upcoming draft? Um, Linda, I'll say this. I believe that Howie Roseman has evolved. And all you have to do is look at this from, the, from a draft perspective. Um, there's still people out there that believe that, you know, he doesn't really know what he's doing. And I think that, you know, Jeffrey Lurie has insulated him with his comments last year that everything we do is a collaboration. What does that do? That takes a lot of the blame off of the plate of Howie Roseman when things don't go right. But the Philadelphia media and the Philadelphia fans, we're not going to live, let him live that down. When you make a pick like J.J. Ortega Whiteside, when you make a pick like Jalen Rager, when you could have had the, you know, the, what was it, the 2019 or 2020 rookie, offensive rookie of the year in, in Justin Jefferson, then, yeah, we're going we're gonna to take you to task for it. Um, but I think what you saw in the draft last year is you saw how we move up. I think they had an idea, you know, of the player that they wanted, but – they took the best available player at 10 last year, and that was Devontae Smith. Because guess what? He was probably better than 10. It just fell out that way, and the Eagles were in the right position at the right time to be able to get the guy that was probably highest on their board. Um, I think that Howie is no longer going rogue when it comes to these draft picks. He's not getting the advice from his scouting department and outside sources and saying, if you're looking at a wide receiver, this is the guy. If you're looking at a running back, this is the guy. If you're looking at a linebacker, this is the guy. And then he goes and does a complete 360 and takes somebody that was not even on anybody's radar because he feels this guy is going to be a diamond in the rough. I don't think, I think that Howie Roseman is done. Howie Roseman is going to draft the guy in the position um, of, of greatest value. That means that when he looks at the board 
and they got players graded, the best available player is the guy that he's going to take. And everybody's going to clap their hands and say, great pick, great pick. You want to know why? Because the gurus, the media, and everybody else, they're going to see the value in that pick. Now, whether that guy pans out, now that's up to that guy to come in and get to work and do what he's got to do to pan out. Okay. Sometimes, you know, it's the players not doing what they're supposed to do that makes Howard Roseman look incompetent. Um, but I don't think you're going to see him go rogue anymore. I think you're going to see him take the guys that he's supposed to take in the position that he's supposed to take them. And there's not going to be much deviation from that. Um, so confident, I don't know. Confident that he'll make the right pick. I'm just confident and I know that he's not going to, you know, you know, go off the go off the farm and take somebody, you know, that that's so unexpected that leaves everyone kind of scratching their head and wondering what the hell is that? All right. Okay. Let's keep it moving now. Um, interesting. Listen, this, this, is, this is kind of what I thought the Eagles should have done anyway. With the trades Howie made earlier this month, do you think it's a chance Howie will use this year's draft to address defense and 2023 to address the offense? Um I understand your logic in that because if you're going to give Jalen Hurts, you know, one more year to find out if he's the guy that you want to be in position, I think that that is what the trade was really all about. When you can go back and get, you know, when you can trade one draft pick this year and get another one next year and a two in 24, then the thought process is we've now got enough draft capital that if Jalen Hurts fall flat on his face, then we can we can be players in the quarterback market next year. Um, I thought that the weakest part of the football team, and, and, and I say that, you know, just because that's how I get the sense that, you know, that they're thinking. Um, I think that they need more weapons but I felt like they should have got those weapons in free agency. I think that they should have got, you know, a veteran, a proven veteran wide receiver um, to go along with um, Devontae Smith and to push Quez Watkins and John Hightower and to elevate the, the level of competitiveness as far as Greg Ward is concerned, either make him step up or step out one or the other. Um, but I thought that this should be a year where the Eagles really improved the defensive side of the ball. Listen, you need a cornerback. Steven Nelson's gone. Not that he was all that great last year. Um, Rodney McLeod is gone. Not that he was all that great last year. But now you got a lot of question marks. Um, along with those question marks, especially with Rodney McLeod leaving, you know, who's going to be the leader back there? Who's going to be the guy that's talking to everybody and trying to get everybody on the same page? You know, you need a linebacker. You know, if, if for nothing else, for no other reason than to create the type of competition at the position that you really need to have there so that the cream rises to the top and you get the best of the best. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, yeah, you went out and you got Hassan Reddick. And I think that he's a hybrid player that, you know, that you can use and have him make a lot of plays for you this year. But I'm not so sure you can line – Hassan Reddick up at, you know, 235 pounds. And somebody chimed in last week and said, oh, he's up at 250. I don't think, I don't think you can line him up at 250. It's six foot 250 and have him line up and play against, you know, offensive tackles that are 330 every single down. You know, I just don't see that. You know, I, I think you need one of these, you know, top flight in rushes, guys at 6'5", 6'4", 6'5", 200 and, 65 to 280 pounds, you know, with long arms. I think you, you they need some more help there. They need more pass rush because they look quite anemic. And, yeah, you got BG coming back. But he's coming back, you know, off of injury. You don't know how long it's going to take him to get back into his flow. I think, you know, Josh Sweat, you know, should have another solid year. But I don't see Josh Sweat as a double-digit sack guy. You know, they need a guy who can come in that strikes fear 
they haven't had that in a, on, in a, with an outside rusher in a long time, you know. So when you think about the needs on the defensive side of the ball, because let's be honest, you can score all the points you want. Let's say the offense clicks next year, okay, and they average anywhere between 21 and, 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 and 26 points a game. Um, most would believe that that's enough points to actually win football games. Not if you're giving up 30. Okay, and and we can talk about and, and, and yeah, the Eagles got one of the easiest schedules in the league again. Okay, but that's what we thought last year. But through seven games, we were two and five against the better team on, teams on our schedule, and the teams that were playoff teams they drug us through the mud. You know, Dallas Cowboys they average what forty something points, 40, 42 points a game in the two games that they played against. Kansas City put up a 40 spot on us. You know, Tampa Bay, they took their foot off the pedal, you know, in the first game. So if you can't stop anybody, it doesn't matter how many points you score because other teams are just going to outscore you, all right? Um, let's see. Jeremiah Pitts wants to know, um, with Gamewell getting a bigger role next year, Miles last year, and B. Scott side for one more year. Do we get another running back in this year's draft? Um, I don't know, man. I, you know, I think what the Eagles are lacking, they're lacking a big back. You know, is Jordan Howard under contract for another year? Are you bringing him back next year? Um, you feel like he's got something left? You know, can you find a, a bruiser um, at running back that's got pretty good feet and, you know, can, can get it done um, because I don't see any one of these guys is really, you know, a third and short type guy or a fourth and type of guy. You know, you want that guy that's got the lean and when he sticks his, gets his um, shoulder pads and, you know, behind, the minute he hits the line, the line is moving forward. You know, I don't see that, you know, with any of the running backs that, you know, that we have. Um, I don't know about Gainwell getting a bigger role because the problem with Gainwell, um, Jeremiah, was the fact that you know he couldn't he couldn't pick up the blitz, and teams knew he couldn't pick up the blitz, so they started blitzing him to keep him in instead of allowing him to get out. And the only way that they could get him out was to motion him out of the backfield. But when you motion him out of the backfield, you essentially go empty unless you're going to go um, what is it twenty personnel. You know, two backs and no tight ends, three wides, you know. And that's something I kind of suggested earlier in the year last year. I was excited to kind of see both Gamewell and Miles Sanders on the field together because, you know, the, the genius of that is, you know, both of them can run the football. You know, Miles at times can be a willing blocker, but Gamewell can be a decoy. So you can motion him out of the backfield, get the matchup that you want outside, turn around and hand it off to Miles, you know, and he's going to pick up four or five yards for you, okay, because they're going to have to remove a guy from the box. Now, conversely, you can keep, you know, keep both guys in, hand it off to Gamewell, let Miles, you know, lead block for him. Um, there's a lot of different things that they could have did. Um, but I think once they realized that he couldn't, he couldn't figure out blitz pickup, you know, um, that was an issue. And if that is the, if that's the scouting report the teams have on him, guess what? Next year they're going to come out and they want him to prove that he can pick up, that he can blitz pickup. And now it's not so much about, you know, understanding who you supposed to pick up. It'll be about the physicality of it because they're not sending some little DB that's the same size as him. You know, they are gonna stand up a guy like um, a guy like Michael Parsons and just bring him up the A gap, and they are gonna ask him to step up and pick up Michael Parsons. That's what that's what's gonna happen. They are gonna bring linebackers up. You know, are you strong enough and are you willing to step up and put your face mask in and get that guy blocked? All right. Let's see. Let's try to get down here to the bottom. David, you're on every week, so I'm going to give you this one. 
Uh, do the Eagles make a move for AJ Brown or Debo? Um, I think if they were gonna make a move, they would have did it. I don't think I don't think the 49ers letting Debo go. They don't pay him whatever they gotta pay him. If that means that Jimmy Garoppolo got to go in order for them to make salary cap space to pay him, you know, that guy's a Swiss Army knife, and he was their offense last year. Um, so he's not going anywhere. I'm trying to understand, you know, why why the Titans are having issues with A.J. Brown. He's the most productive wide receiver that they have. Yeah, he's had some injury issues, but when he's, when he's healthy, man, he is a beast. You know, I mean, he, he by himself is – a large reason why, you know, they made the playoffs last year. So I'm not sure I understand, you know, the thought behind A.J. Brown or Debo saying being being um, moved. But I would think with all the movement that Howie's made and, you know, the cap space that he's cleared, how he's extended guys and, you know, giving guys, um, what do you call it, um, bonuses so that they can push the money out rather than the money counting counting against the cap you know as bonuses in later years that he's done a lot of different things and i think if he was going to make that move you know that move should have been made you know a long time ago all right that, just my opinion uh, nobody knows what um what the wizard of roseman is up to um let me see what else we got here. Now, Tom, there you go again. Good, good, good comment. Um, and this was kind of in reference to Colin Murray. He says, you know, today's athletes have more pull than ever. I would agree. Um, you know, listen, when you got players that's making more money than the head coach and the GM, he all of a sudden becomes you know, one of the most powerful players on the team um, because there's a certain amount of his money that's, that's 100% guaranteed. And as an owner, you're looking at the bottom line. You, you're looking at the team, but you're also looking at the bottom line. And you're saying, well, hell, we can go get another coach because we're only paying this guy 4 or $5 million, maybe six. Um, we can't go get another quarterback because we committed, you know, for the next three years of paying him thirty-five to forty million dollars. So guess who who you think is going to go? You know, um, and players, in, in my opinion, Tom, players having more pull is a good thing because you know during my time we had no pull. Okay, I can take you guys back to a time where there was no free agents, where. You know, when you got drafted by a team, that team owned your rights. And they say, hey, we got 150000 you come and play for it, or you can sit your ass at home until you want to do so. And by the way, every day you sit out, you know, we deduct and we prorate now. Um, now, you know, we went, went on strike in 1987 so that players would have the opportunity, like every other business and every other industry, to shop their wares um, after a certain amount of time. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have some balance. It's a good thing for the owners not to have complete control over everything all the time. You know, they already control enough. You know, 10-year CBA. You know, D. Maurice, D. Maurice Smith was dumb enough to, you know, allow the players for, to fall for that. You never had a 10-year CBA in the history of the NFL, and they go and sign one a year ahead of schedule, you know, a week before the owners actually negotiate the TV deal with Amazon coming on, taking on Thursday night games next year and a hundred billion dollars players got hoodwinked, you know? So they need to figure out a way where they can get, you know, a little more, a little more power and a little more say so, and you know, what they do and how, um, how, how things transpire. All right. Let me see. We got about five minutes here. Let's scroll down, see how many good ones we can get. Um, Skip Carl, he got a question about Randall. He saw a comment. He says, can you imagine what Randall's numbers would have been under Andy Reid? Hey, listen, I tell people all all the time. I'm like, you guys have no idea how great Randall Cunningham could have been with the right offensive staff. And if you want to know, go back to 1998, okay? He was with the Minnesota Vikings. And go and look up his stats that year. 
off the charts. I'm still perplexed, perplexed, but happy, you know, um, that they lost to the Atlanta Falcons in the, in the NFC championship game, because, you know, I was on the Broncos that year. We wound up playing, you know, the Atlanta Falcons and that game was over at halftime. You know, we actually you know won the Super Bowl, but we really should have been playing the Minnesota Vikings, which would have been a tall task, you know, for the Denver, a taller task because they had some, they had some, some players on that team, man. some players, but you go back and look at that season and look what um, Brian Billick did with Randall Cunningham and Randall could have had that kind of coach in his entire career. He would have been a first ballot hall of fame and no doubt. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Um, um, Eddie Edwards, uh, nowadays edge linebackers hold more value than traditional linebackers. Um, yeah, there might be some some truth to that. You know, I, I just I have issue with you know how you call a guy who is undersized a tweener, who pretty much lines up in a four man front, and that's what we play today. Unless you get in the five man line, okay, or unless you get into you know, a three-man line, and you actually got four down and three linebackers on the field, you're basically running a four-two front, okay? So this whole thing about, you know, some of these guys being linebackers is nonsensical because when a guy lines up and he's rushing the passer on every damn pass play, that's not a linebacker, okay? That's a defensive end. And you can call him an edge rusher. You can call him whatever the hell you want to call him. They're an edge rusher because they're smaller than – the traditional 4-3 defensive end. But in the grand scheme of things, they ain't nothing more than a defensive end. Why are we calling them that? Okay? And, yeah, there's more value put on a guy that can disrupt the quarterback than a guy who's off the line playing a run and, you know, being a hybrid playing the pass behind them with um, with the secondary. All right? Let's see. Um Last question here before we sign off. Um, here we go. Everybody wants to know this. Can the Eagles win a Super Bowl in the next three years? What are the three things they need to do? Um, quickly. Um, yes. When I look at what other teams have done, when I look at you know how they stumble into the Super Bowl win in 2017, I would say absolutely they can. Uh, what do they need to do? Um they need to be more explosive on offense. Um, the play calling has to be, you know, much more succinct and tied together. They need to be more aggressive on the defensive side of the ball. And they need to make some plays that change, you know, the momentum in games on the special team side. That's the one thing that the Eagles had in 2017. They were very good on defense. They were explosive on offense. And every once in a while, they give you something real special on the special team side, all right? So I, I believe they can, um, especially in this free free agent era. They can. They got some work to do, and if they can get, if they can get the pieces here, um, I believe that they can, all right? Hey, listen, guys, that's the show for today. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we'll be back next week. I'm going to have a special guest for you all next week with the draft rolling around. Me and my dude, we'll chop it up. We'll talk about it and, um, you know, get you guys prepped for, I believe it's Thursday night, round one, for the 2022 NFL Draft. Hey, listen, you guys be good to each other and take care of each other. But most important, make sure you love each other. I'll see you guys right back here next week, same place, same time. Thank you for watching. This has been Seth Jones Show. Peace.